Hey y'all, welcome back to Love, Sweat, and Tears, Ingredients for Transformative Campus Leadership. Speaking of transformative, y'all, today I talked with Teresa Morris. Her work really is transformative, and I cannot wait for you guys to hear what she's got going on and what she's accomplished. Oh my gosh. Um, Teresa is a name that you might not be familiar with yet, but you will be soon. She's been in education for over 30 years between classroom teaching, district administration. She's worked with Smarter Balanced and the College Board. Um, She worked with Stanford for a while and now has impasse education. Um, You can find all of the links to everything that she mentions in the show notes below. And I cannot wait for you guys to hear what she's doing and how we can begin to implement it in our classrooms and really change the landscape for student success. Let's dive in. All right. Well, today I'm here with Teresa Morris to talk all lots of different things, math literacy, performance assessments, um, some of the really cool work that she's doing with students and just equipping them and showing them their capability and um, how that. I don't know, maybe different from what a lot of schools are doing and why we should move more in that way. Teresa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me here. I'm so appreciative. So before we kind of dig into the work that you're doing, I want to know a little bit more about you, where you come from, um, and what you were like as a student, what school was like for you as a kid. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for asking. Um, I always think of myself as a simple person with humble beginnings. Um, My father is 100% disabled and he's blind and he's a veteran. And so I had a unique childhood in that both parents were always home. My my mother as a caregiver. I have three brothers, one older, two younger. And I bring that up for this reason, because you're asking about how was school for like for me. As the only daughter, we were very gender based. So it was always do everything in in the house and be a homemaker and all of those things. But when I got into school, it was very simple for me. School came easily. I quickly recognized what you do to get a good grade and how you move forward. Um, But then I noticed how all three of my brothers, even though they're brilliant, struggled and they were channeled in one direction where I was channeled in another direction. And it was very obvious that I was intended to get straight A's and that was just expected. And then when I get into high school, I realize everyone similar to my brothers was pushed one direction and no one ever tried to do something better for them. And even though I was in all the college readiness courses and all those things, um, the summer before my senior year, when I was picking out my senior classes, my guidance counselor, who was a very close personal friend of the family, knew that I knew how to take care of a house and run a household, decided it'd probably not be good for me to take AP calculus and AP language arts and physics because I hadn't taken any home ec classes yet. That devastated me that for 12 years I had been groomed to go to college. And then the cusp, that last step, hmm, someone who I really trust says, maybe you ought to be ready to be a homemaker. And I thought, that's crazy. Um, so that, that impacted me a lot in the fact that we need to break down a lot of different stereotypes uh, not only gender, but race and ethnicity and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, they used to tell my brother that, you know, you're never going to be better than this or a mechanic or do something because he has dyslexia and the man is brilliant. So I look out at our education system and I said, we should really change the focus and saying, how do we make you achieve your happiness in whatever that takes? whatever skill you want to incorporate and whatever job you want, because we should value our electricians, plumbers, and carpenters as much as we value our doctors, lawyers, and policemen. All of us can be productive citizens and be part of our country and make it a better place and part of our world to make it a better place. And we shouldn't just say college is here. And that's the first choice and technical school. That's a plan B. No, be honored and respected. So that's, that's my take from my high school years and college years is that I've really been passionate about that because of those experiences in high school. What what was that kind of, you know, you have this conversation with your counselor, you're kind of discouraged. Did you follow her advice? Did you take the home at classes or did you go? I want to know. What's funny is um, he was an elder at my church and 
um, he and my dad were really close friends and I just kind of listened to him. And I was like, there was that moment of, do I give in? And I think if I hadn't known him so well, I would have, but I felt comfortable enough saying, you know, I know how to cook. You know that I know how to take care of a household. Why would I take home economics when those are things my mother can teach me? My mother cannot teach AP calculus, physics, or advanced English. And that conversation, he kind of took for a moment. He goes, wait a second. Huh, that's a good point. And he kind of was mature at that point and said, that's a very good point. So if you want to take AP calculus, I don't say it's going to be useful for you. So we still had to get that dig in there of it's not going to be useful for you as a mother. But I was like, no, I said, my future is in academia and that's what I need to do. And he goes, well, that's good. He goes, but if there's anybody else other than you, I wouldn't allow it. And I was like, you wouldn't. I said, you're this gatekeeper. I am completely qualified for these courses. And you're going to not allow me to do it. So roll forward to August of my senior year. The, all my classes, the calculus, the physics, and the language arts are half male, half female. So was he singling me out or was he singling all females out? And did all females have to overcome that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to that. I've never asked them if they were encouraged to do home ec as I was. But we grew up in a rural community with, you know, at that time, two family, you know, two parent families and everything else. And it was still very gender specific. So almost all the women knew how to do those things. Where were you from originally? Rural Indiana. Indiana. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah. okay. So you finish high school. What was kind of that quickly, just that jump from high school to college? How did you find your major? What influences did you have there? Like, how did you kind of decide what you wanted to study? I think I always knew I always wanted to go into education. So the transition from high school to college, there wasn't one. It was just more of the same. No big aha moment. Um, I love the fact that in college, uh, I was able to explore a lot of different degrees and get a, several minors. So even though I knew I was going to do math education, I didn't do the education math. I did pure mathematics. So I was be very, very strong in math. Then I did pure education. Then I had physics, philosophy, history, and coaching of all things. And I think the coaching major may have helped me the most um, because at that time, I kind of wanted to be a high school math teacher and a coach. And it wasn't until after college that I got involved in a program called Project Seed. That's a national nonprofit organization that teaches fourth grade students advanced math concepts to change their view of what they're capable of and to change the paradigm of what students are capable of. And I think in that, the 20 years I was with Project Seed changed was as a person and gave me the strength to step out and say, I know what I'm doing. I am an expert in this field. And I think students are capable of if we stop with the paradigms of what students can do based on their home life, based on their geography, what have you. Everyone, every student has talent. Every human being has talent. Shouldn't education be about bringing that talent out and fostering it and promoting it and showing the student where they have a pathway to their success? And again, their success is defined by them. Before we get to how we do that, because I think that's really important, mm -hmm. can you kind of quickly tell me, like, what was it like when you were in the classroom? What did you observe? And how did you make the transition from teaching in the classroom to what you're doing now? Sure, sure. So when I was with the program called Project Seed, we were a supplemental math program. So we would go into classrooms and teach um, for like 45 minutes a day and then go to another classroom. So I would see six different classrooms in a day. What prompted me very quickly was that I had the ability to engage students in very deep, meaningful conversations about pure mathematics at an early age. And they were incredibly successful. And the teachers would tell me that, you know, these students don't act this way when you're not here. And they would have strong classrooms involvement, there would be very little classroom management issues, no disruptions, 100% engagement, 100% of the time. And again, that deep conversation without me as the teacher needing to tell anyone who was correct or who was incorrect. And it was all through a seminar kind of approach. And what stuck out the most is even strong quality teachers that I met during that time 
still had set expectations of students based on what they saw during the day. And then I got to break those paradigms. And I was like, I like doing this and I want to do this. What made me realize is students who are off task are off task, not because they don't know the material, but because they don't feel engaged, they don't feel it's important or they already know the material. So engaging those students in productive means and through engaging ideas and things that they see relevant. To me, I found during that time that that was a key and that teachers need to be trained in how to do that and why it's important to have the right content to pull all students in. Was that something you were taught get... through Project Seed or just through your college courses? Like, how did you learn those skills? I would say it was boots on the ground, honestly. Most of my, uh, I would say most of my career, yes, college laid the, the groundwork for it. But in Project Seed, it was a lot of curriculum development, teacher development, uh, training for district administrators and so forth. It was very much like a second a, a master's program. In fact, the Council of Graduate Schools um, provided us and uh, awarded all members of Project Seed as a master's degree because it was such intensive training. So you would teach during the day, and then we'd have two hours of workshops as employees by PhD mathematicians and psychologists and educators. So we were a unique hub, and it really put me out there as a learning environment, but also you were learning about students while you were teaching the psychology and the brain development of students. It was all in that moment. And it was almost like we were our, our own university, if you will. And so it was a very unique experience to gain that, that self-awareness in what you were good at, but also in where the boundaries are within schools. So I love Oh, the boundaries are those things in which certain principals want teachers to act and produce in a certain way. They expect certain t students to act and produce in a certain way. And if you go up the chain, a superintendent has expectations of certain members. So what's interesting is if you look at the classroom as a microcosm and the expectations teachers have of their students based on whatever background, based on whatever they're observing, those exist through up the chain all the way up through the superintendents. And you see in school systems this hierarchy that happens that, oh, well, this teacher is not really a good teacher and we're going to not let this teacher be a bad influence on students anymore. So what are we going to do? We'll promote that teacher to this level. Well, then they paper pushers and they're really good at paper pushing. And trust me, they're doing the job they're asked to do, but they're so good at it, they get promoted again. All of a sudden, they wind up in a position to tell teachers how to teach. They were never teachers. And it just drives me nuts. Yeah. So that, that whole system needs to be rethought. Uh, in the future, it can be. Um, until then, I, I know there's, my, there, there's pockets where that's actually working and people are doing great jobs. People are not getting promoted just for the sake of promotions. But it happens. It's a cancer within the environment. And because it's still so ingrained, it's it's pervasive and it is it's stifling our future so you are with this organization how did you kind of branch off and start doing your own thing like what was that process like when did you decide to leave tell me more about that so the superintendent of the school district i was working with our, our primary district he called me in for a meeting it was our annual get to, you know, overview of what we're doing, kind of a meeting. I did all my meeting, gave all the presentation, started to close up my stuff. He goes, now my meeting's beginning. And I said, okay. He says, well, for years, I've been trying to change the educational system. He says, and you're an influence in that. He says, but you can't change it from the outside. And so sitting right there, he offered me a job as the director of mathematics for the district. And he said, he'd give me carte blanche, make changes. I would be the only person answering for mathematics. And if I said it happened, it would happen. So I took on the role of administrator for um, about six, seven years. And I had full control over everything K-12 in mathematics. We revised curriculum, we revised teaching practices, and we saw phenomenal change. 
And I was very, very proud of that moment. But that gave me that insight of what is it like to be an administrator? From there, the Brawl Hill, the testing organization, saw all the work I was doing. Because I didn't like their testing system. And so, because they were all multiple choice, no thought processes. So, including thoughtful questions and thoughtful test questions. And so they, they hired me. They stole me from the district and hired me. At that point, Smarter Balance came out and they asked me to help write the Smarter Balance assessments and the Smarter Balance performance tasks in particular. So I became the leading expert in the country on the Smarter Balance math performance tasks. In fact, I authored the original set. I authored over 90% of them. Yeah, it was all the combination of what I did in Project Seed, what I did it as administrator. So you put in those 10,000 hours, that moment that that was coming together. Well, lo and behold, Stanford University was the ones overseeing that. Well, they hired me. <laughs> well, and the first thing I needed to do at Stanford University was called Building Educator Assessment Literacy. And so that took me all over the country identifying what are performance tasks, why they are important, how do they actually test student skills, but more importantly, the application of skills. And that's the first time in a national assessment, we started thinking about what does it mean for students to be able to use math as a tool rather than just regurgitate facts. So the performance task is the first time that has happened. That led to curriculum development. One thing led to another. And then I decided it was time for me to start my own, my own business. So that's where it led to. Um, so I have all these nice stepping stones. I have all these nice connections. I've had these experiences to work with and gain a tremendous colleagues that have influenced me, but I have found that unique level of what we call curriculum embedded assessments, which is a lot like based learning. But I think I've discovered uh, working with my own company and creating that year-long curriculum, a curriculum that actually holds true and does exactly what it's intended to do. So that journey was an interesting journey, not personally, but professionally as well. And I know I needed every one of those steps along the way to make me the person I am today, to have the strength to say, yes, I, I own my own business. And it relies on me and, and my employees are relying on me to do the right things. So tell me uh, quickly a little bit about what you're doing right now, what your business looks like. And then I want to talk about some of the things that you've shared and specifically how campus leaders can equip their teachers to teach math well or teach other things well. So what are you doing right now? Tell me more about your business. So Empass Education is focused on creating real world applications for the use and application of content skills. So we're about supporting schools in to stop this mindless teaching one unit after another that doesn't relate to the real world in any way. So we partner with school districts to create that curriculum, predominantly in math. However, we're already branching out in social studies, which think about learned history. You're like, why am I learning about all these dead people? You need to know the connection in my life today relates today. So I now have an expert in social studies here as well, and she's creating those per performance assessments. Um, our end result is this. We want students and teachers to no longer see any content area as a barrier to their success. And predominantly and historically, mathematics has always been that gatekeeper. And we're accomplishing it. We've been working with this curriculum out in Antelope Valley now for four years. Our first year graduating um, in the next week and we've seen it in them. They no longer see that as a barrier. And when I asked the teacher, one of the teachers who was our cohort, first cohort teacher, and she followed her students all four years. So she has a senior group of math literacy students, a group of AP calculus. Clearly your AP calculus students know more math. She goes, yeah. I said, but when this group, think about both groups and they go to take and try to purchase a car or make a large purchase sometime in their life. Which group is going to use math to help inform their decisions? Without hesitation, she said, the math literacy students. She goes, they do it. The calculus students, they might rationalize, 
but they may not be prompted to use math to make that decision. That's what our goal was. That's why we called it math literacy is that we are producing students who will use math as a tool, good decisions in their life, at least to make good decisions in their life. I studied math education for my first few years in college, and that was such a thing for me of seeing math as a tool for your life for so many situations in life, rather than like, yeah, like a barrier, like this one hurdle in school that you have to get over to get through school. Um, oh, I love it so much. Um, yeah. I want to talk some, this podcast is for campus leaders, so I want to talk some about how we can, how, how campus leaders can manage making some of these changes with their teachers? How can they coach teachers through project-based learning? How can how can they apply these things in a way that's effective and manageable? That is a, that, that's the $10,000 question. It really is. Um, and, and the answer is, we, we need to be honest with ourselves. There's not one correct path, but there is one necessity. You have to be dedicated to it and you have to make the time for it. And when I say those two things, dedicated to it and make the time for it, it means you need to take other things off the plate. Stop grabbing the next shiny thing that may or may not work or that replicates something you're already doing and it's not working either. Cut out the things that aren't working. If you're going to be dedicated to project-based learning, your teachers need five years to get to, get to that point. I know that's ouch, five years, I need change now. Change now doesn't happen. Can we accept there is no silver bullet, there's no immediate flip a switch and things happen? If there was, we would all be doing it, correct? Okay, well, it's not. So start with small steps. Start with a cohort of teachers who want to do this. If you're starting with a group of teachers that don't want to do this or that you're trying to get rid of, you're just wasting your time and whoever's helping you do that. So start with a cohort of teachers who want to do it. Then start showing the evidence of how their students' performance is changing. And then you keep adding a cohort of teachers all the time. And as a supervisor, as an administrator, you have to be willing to say, classrooms will no longer look the way they have. Okay, so let's be logical about it. The way classrooms look right now, single file, sit and get, being taught. It's quiet and it's orderly. I can go in and look at it and say, yes, you wrote the objective of today on the board. Yes, you talked about standards. Yes, you, I do, you do, we do. We, okay. None of that's truly working. It's going to look chaotic. You're going to have students in a math class building a pinata and you're like, wait, I didn't walk into an art classroom. No, you didn't because we're applying math to a real world situation. That real world needs to show up in the classroom. So the way you expect teachers to move about and the interaction between teacher and student needs to be transformed. And that the teacher becomes a facilitator and that just-in-time instruction rather than just the sit and get. We have known for years the sit and get does not work. It just doesn't work. You can't ask students to parrot us and act like they care about it. You're going to get that top 10% that care about it. Everybody else is just wading through it. So if we can shift as an administrator, say, wait a second, if the teacher's talking 80% of the time, students aren't paying attention 80% of the time. Then we get the students doing and talking 80% of the time. And then that teacher just providing that just-in-time instruction. Because here's the point. A teacher in a project-based learning, they try to think of this. Well, I need to teach the students how to do the math that's in the project before we do the Okay, that's our normal thought. So you teach, you start the project, and guess what? The students still run into the same struggles. And they're like, well, can you teach us? And then the teacher is frustrated because I already taught you that. The students get the sense of, oh, I'm stupid because I didn't get it. Something's wrong with me. I didn't get it. Well, you didn't get it because it wasn't connected to anything. Different teacher launches the project, does the project. The students still run into the same struggle, but now they're running into it for the first time. There's no previous failure experience. This is the first moment. Now I give that just-in-time instruction. The students want to hear it because they want to continue on with the project. It's more efficient. Even though you feel like you're setting your students up for failure, you're not. You're setting them up for success. Because I like to point out to administrators and teachers both, there was a study that's not been well recognized or talked about. 
Students who have had three experiences of failure begin to see it as a personal attack on their identity. So the fourth time that comes up, they're already withdrawn and they're putting up barriers to not let this impact them. Three, three, that's all it takes. By the second one, they're already starting to pull away and not listen. But by the third one, it is shut down. So every administrator, when they're trying to support a teacher, they're looking for how do you build success while avoiding failure experiences? Now, we need, still need productive failure. We still need to bring that in. But where do you bring it in where the student feels encouraged to, to overcome it? And to that point, in our math literacy classes, we interviewed students. And to hear the senior saying, I now understand what it means to have failure. And it's not failure. It just means it didn't work that time. And it's the next step to learning the next process. And that's that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I created the environment for that student to gain that understanding. For a student who was in this class because they were designated as not being good at math. And so to see that come around and say, yes, I understand there are times we're not going to get something right. It doesn't mean I have to quit. It means it's the next step closer to trying the, to finding the real solution. And I like the idea of introducing the problem and the potential for failure and then saying, here is the tool, because then you understand immediately the relevance of that tool. Like it's just, uh, I wish we could teach, like I wish I could snap my fingers and we just begin teaching this way. Um, what... So what, what was the process like of designing the math literacy project curriculum? Wow. <laughs> so I got a phone call in December okay. from the district administrator I'd worked with okay. for several years. And he says, hey, here's this crazy idea. I, I want to do something for students who are three to five years below grade level in math. Okay. So that's fun. Entering ninth grade, which in normal cases, if you're entering ninth grade that far below, again, you get on that certain track that nobody really wants to deal with you. And all they want you to get is a for diploma. That, that's what they want. Um, he says, so he gave me this crazy plan. And I said, okay. He says, well, I'm going to give you a year and a half to get ready for it. I said, okay. He called me back probably two months later. He goes, well, actually you get three months to get ready for it. Okay, so we know we needed to create a project-based curriculum, one that avoided many of the other project-based curriculums around which, you know, the context of the story or of the project overtakes the math. So the whole time, okay, how do you create a curriculum that balances the math skills so they're not, but still engages the students in a real context? And so um, my co-founder, Katie, my, who also happens to be my daughter, she has a master's degree in sociology. So the two of us, and she's also brilliantly academic uh, and thinking wise. The good thing about the two of us is that we think on opposite sides. And so anything you're thinking of, she can pull apart and we go back and forth. And between the two of us, you get something really strong. So we started out with six teachers. And when we started the year, we probably had five projects and that was it. And so we kept telling the teachers, we are building this plane while we're flying it. But what we knew is what we wanted to do is the first couple of projects had to demystify and change the outlook of how students saw math. One of the first projects they did was this class aquarium. And you're like, wait a second, a class aquarium? Yeah, all we're wanting to do is get a fish tank, a fish tank in the classroom. So the students researched about aquariums. They learned about Y equals MX kind of cost and writing those kind of equations. And you add the cost of the tank. Full-time mathematically, we're building up to Y equals MX plus B. Students don't know that. They're just doing it. And then they present on what fish tank they want and what fish they want and the total cost and is it in budget and so forth. And then the magical moment happened. The fish tank appears in their classroom. And the students didn't believe that the fish tank would actually make it there. Because like people talk about things all the time. It's theoretical. Hypothetical. And all of a sudden now it's tangible. You've got an actual fish tank. And what I've seen happen is now it's a tangible success. Every time that student walks in the room, they're like, I did that. I was part of that happening. 
Then the next project is another element of, again, you're breaking down those failure experiences. You're breaking through years of failure experiences for them to start saying, I can do this. I can problem. By problem solving, I'm learning to do math. So that first year was rocky. In the sense of we were trying to figure out what works. So you had skills practice. You had you know just basic problem practice. You had the actual project overall. You had the elements of the project. You had the request. This is every project ends with a summative assessment, which is the exact same format as a smarter balanced performance task. And I did that on purpose. Because I knew eventually someone would be like, oh, this is feel good math, but nobody really knows math. This is hardcore, the same as smarter balance. If I handed these, balance, they'd go part of their, their elements. So I knew we wanted to impact the math skills as well. So you're thinking on multiple levels, the social aspect, the emotional aspect, the physical aspect, and of course, the mental capabilities as well. And that's what's fascinating to see how the teachers have grown. And how students have grown and to be able to watch the students because at the end of that first year, the end of the pilot year, COVID hit. We didn't even get to hear it. COVID hit, students went home. How do I go the last two months? Like everybody else in the country, project-based learning, a brand new program at that. How do we make this happen? My thought was, oh, my gosh, with COVID, they're going to cancel it. They didn't. We did the next year completely online. We had more... Gosh, we, we really changed that trying to create and maintain that social aspect. And at a time when most of the classrooms were having like under 50% participation, our math literacy classes were at 85% participation because they had that social interaction element. We still had group projects. We still had students talking to each other and it helped build that social element. Students weren't attending any other class, but they would come to this class. And this was still with kids that had been three years behind. Yes. I feel like these kinds yes. of programs are often for the kids that are advanced. And I love the fact that you guys, you know, that it was specifically with kids that were already behind showcasing, like this is for everyone. This breaks down those barriers. Yes. Awesome. Hey, tell me, absolutely. tell me more about you know now that these kids are older, where they are now. So they're seniors and they're getting ready to graduate. I interviewed all of the mm -hmm. seniors, and over sixty percent of them have accepted and are planning to go to a four-year college. Wow. And again, these were students who weren't expected to right. graduate. Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. So my heart melts, and I'm like, okay. We, we, we accomplished something that most people would only dream of. And so it's that moment of, and they're telling me, you know, what they're majoring in and where they're going and who got scholarships and who didn't. And of the other 40%, many of them are going directly into the workforce. Uh, one student, uh, George, uh, he got a huge promotion at work. And mostly because his, he, he attributed to this, this course, this class. He said, I learned how in this class how to collaborate and problem solve. And there was an incident at his work that there was an issue and he stepped up as a collaborator and trying to build consensus and his boss witnessed it. And he goes, we need to be a leader. He goes, why would I go to college if now I'm, I'm going to be earning you know, so much money a year he goes, and it's in a career field that I want. And I said, you've got your career, you go with it. And so the success rate is very high. And quite a few of the students are going to community college as well. So again, these were students who, potentially would not have graduated had it not been for this course. So that's who they are. We want to stay with them. We want to follow up with them to see how they do in those first college. Our goal was that not only would math not be a hindrance in high school, but that it wouldn't be a hindrance in college either, that they could get that first required math course and not have to retake it or so forth. Because if you fail that required math course, your likelihood of graduating from college declines immensely. So we'll find out next year how well they do in that course. Have you continued this with other cohorts or have you just kind of looked at this one cohort? Actually, every year there was a new cohort. So it's been nice. We've added more teachers. We've added more students. So every year it's, it's been growing. And um, we're now in all of the schools in that district. And it's working incredibly well. Each district or each school within that district has its own struggles. You know, it own culture and so forth. And what they're finding out is 
the schools that are doing it the way I'm asking them to. And the teacher follows the students and it's scheduled together and all of these wonderful things, you're getting these fantastic results. And if you're not, if you're taking the teachers out every year, the results aren't quite as good. They're still good. They're not quite as good. Um, so there's getting some internal competition now of like, this school that normally doesn't test as well. They're testing better. And they're saying what the difference is, is the, our program. I'm not about the test scores, but you have to play that game in school because principals know their test scores is what matters. So we will make sure that that happens. Um, but our students outperform and outgrow uh, using the NWEA scores. So the whole district, everyone in the district uses NWEA scores. For the first year, our students have more growth than their counterparts by just a little bit. But the next two years, it, it becomes exponential. And that growth by the third year is significantly different. This has been so productive that the alternative education sites at that school district, 100% of the students use the math literacy program in all math classes. There's no other choice. They went from 20% math credits to over 65% math credits in just one year. So it's quite incredible. So it's working, on, it's working with students who are below grade level at their site, but it's also working for students who are in this alternative situation for whatever reason. But they see this as a, as a bright spot. In fact, you had some students at the alternative site say, can I just keep taking more math? You're like, wait, can you say that again? And they're like, yeah, yeah. I just want to keep taking more math. I have to get a PE credit and an art credit. He goes, but I'd rather just take math. So we devised and we selected some of the courses from our geometry course that's more art related. And our teacher says, you do these three projects, you get your art. Pro your art. And so he stayed in the class to do the math project that was art infused and he got art wow. credit. Wow. So. Oh, man. That, that's crazy. Um. I just, I feel like I'm just blown away. Like this just feels like the gem that we've all been wanting for math. Um, uh. Beth, I feel that um, probably two years ago, I, st I st we were joking. I said, I feel like the Grinch who stole Christmas, who says, you know, in the opening scenes, solve world <laughs> hunger, tell no yeah. one. Solve the math problem, tell no one. And I feel that because I now have, a, a, Ray Pichon is a, a good friend of mine, and he was my boss at Stanford University. And his friend, Stuart Call, the two of them have been doing an internal review and evaluation of the math literacy program. Two powerhouse evaluators. And they've told me over and over again, they've never seen anything this powerful. So I need to be ready as a company to respond to the questions and, and the demands that are going to come out after they submit their final findings, which will probably come next year. Um, and I get that. Um, it is unique. But here's the thing. You asked what administrators could do. The first thing you need to know is not every solution is transferable without some sort of specialization or personalization. So to pick up the math literacy project from Antelope Valley and move it to San Diego or you know, Indiana, what have you, there's going to need to be some tweaks. There is no one bulletproof solution. And I'm saying that even about my own program. I can't just package it up, put a ribbon on it and say, here you go, world, take it. It won't work. It's the combination of I have trained the teachers based on my observations of the teachers. And each of the teachers I've worked with over the four years has slightly been changed. I've had individual meetings with teachers. It's been customized. It's been to the point of certain projects were in there because students in the project asked for them. Well, that entertained and engaged those students. It may not entertain or engage another group of students. So there has to be some flexibility to it. But the core of it is what needs to stay the same. I feel that creation of the curriculum and the design of the curriculum is set. Our topics might change, but what will most likely change is the training for the teachers. What, what do you look for where, when you're doing that, when you're customizing the way that you train teachers? What is it? What are some of the th markers that you look for to let you know what teachers need 
help with? It's actually while I'm observing them, how are they interacting with okay. the students? What math do they know? And let's all admit this. There's a lot of high school math teachers that know math education. Yes. But they can't even answer the question, where am I ever going to use this? Because they don't know. So when you start now embedding math within a project-based learning, sometimes that first year the teachers are like, I didn't see the math. What math, what math were we doing? And I was like, and I listed it out. So then I started creating other avenues for them to start to see the math and to understand it's more than just the context that's there. I always look for classroom management. If you're going to do project-based learning and students are going to be using box cutters to cut apart cardboard, you need to know that the teacher can handle that classroom. We watched one of our teachers go from that very first year of taking 45 minutes to literally have students organize their notebook by cutting out things and gluing it onto pages. And I said, I was like, you knew I was coming today. This is what you opted to do is you took 45 minutes. And by the way, out of your class of 28, you glued 24 of them in the right place. The other four were like, I'm done. What am I doing? To now, she is our most advanced teacher because she's like, I'm not going to be embarrassed by that again. She does the most projects in a year. Her students stay on task, stay on target. Yes, they're still crazy. They're still talking and everything else. But they were to the point of we're not going to get through enough projects in their senior year. And they wanted to get through them all. They started doing two. They had started layering two projects at a time. So you went from the group of, same group of students, same group of students, same teacher. Where the students were so off task trying to just milk it for all it was worth and take 45 minutes to glue pieces of paper the paper at that into something to now say, no we can plan the class party project and be doing insurance at the same time wow because they now saw the value of yeah. it yeah and i see the the, the mirroring that's happening between what the teacher is learning and what the kids are learning and how they're both learning through failure and sharing that experience and the community that that has to be creating and the culture in the classroom and yeah. wow. And Beth, you brought up a great point. Um, we actually are working with those, the pilot teachers who have gone with their students for four years. This graduation is emotional. They have like, I know my students better than I know any other group of students. And these students, these teachers are avid teachers. So they're used to following students four years in a row projects break down that barrier between teacher and student. You're talking about buying a house, buying a car, taking a vacation, understanding insurance, understanding loans. It breaks, because now you start talking about personal elements and the teachers are like, I have to prepare myself that I'm letting go of family. And the students comment on how much this becomes a family and they hold each other accountable. You had students to other students, hey, we we needed you here this morning and you were 10 minutes late, so we couldn't get started on this because you had this information. So you have that built-in accountability as well. So as part of the curriculum, we have the same curriculum. What we have are career readiness lessons because in the curriculum, your students are going to reach out to external individuals. So you want them to know what professionalism is. You want them to know how to build and make connections. So that element takes them on from early on what is professionalism, what is etiquette, how do you greet people, to they are completing a resume and a job interview or a, or a college interview. Then we also have what we're calling self-awareness lessons built in. Because of the fact that you need to build in that responsibility, you need to build in that accountability, you need to build in the understanding of where am I growing and how am I growing. So take the curriculum with the career ready with the self-awareness lessons, all of these things are wrapped in together. It's a full one place, all curriculum. So I hate when administrators are like, oh, social emotional learning, that's important. Everyone stop on Wednesday and we're doing social emotional learning. Again, now it's just disjoint. It's not having the impact you want. And disconnected and not so, relevant to anything else. So you're just adding on a layer to add on a layer. All of those things need to be built in together. And I feel like our curriculum has done that. And I can see it by the students. So I, I'm really proud of what they've accomplished in the four years and what we've built the platform. Because I always tell people as the curriculum writer, 
It's words on paper. The teachers have to bring it to life. And that's where that professional development for teachers is so important. And that's why principals and administrators, like I said earlier, they need to commit to the five years. That teacher change didn't happen overnight. It took time. And some teachers are going to grow faster than others. And we have to give them that room for their productive failure and for them to grow with their students. Is some of that baked into the curriculum that you have? How administrators can do that? Not necessarily. We've been focused so much on the teacher and the grassroots of it that next year we're going to start bringing in that administrator and the mentoring teacher element Um, because we need, I need administrators not to derail it. Um, For instance, one administrator kept saying, no, you can't get a fish tank. And we're like, you're breaking the process. That's a fatal flaw in the education system. Finally, to get you know, so administrators need to look back, and yes, they need to do their job and be discerning of what's trivial and what's real, but know the difference. Know that students who have experienced many years of failure experiences need a tangible, physical element to say that's my success. And sometimes it's a fish tank, sometimes it's a field trip, but embrace both of those. Embrace the path that works. And it might mean we need art supplies and math because you know what? Art and math are related. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, you know, as these kids are graduating, you told me some stories about impasse publishing. I would love if you could tell our listeners a little bit about what that is, um, what's happening with that, what your kids are doing. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. So, with the project-based learning, the outcome is always some sort of exhibition of demonstrating student knowledge. Sometimes it's a video, sometimes it's a presentation, what have you. Well, last year there was a really unique situation where daylight savings time started and they were doing the shadows project. Well, the sun didn't come up in time to videotape how to use shadows to find the height of a tree. So the teacher improvised. She said, you know what? Demonstrate your knowledge in any other way you can think of. One student, Kayla Maples, authored a student book. And the teacher, I was there visiting like the next day or something, and the teacher showed it to me. And when I read this student authored book, truly that was just intended as a class assignment to demonstrate her understanding, I was like, this is worthy of being published. So I met with the student, and from there, I was like, we're determined to figure out a way to publish this book because we want authentic outcomes to all of our projects. What's more authentic than publishing a book? It took me a year, just a, just almost a year, to figure out how to publish. And so I decided that the best approach was that Empass Education would publish student-authored and student-illustrated books. Um, and I want to bring in that element of student-illustrated as well, because that partnership between the author and the illustrator nothing to do with math, but everything to do with learning how to be a professional in a field, in any field. So when we figured out how to publish a book through Amazon, that's called, um, so if you go to Amazon and just search for How Tall is Lulu, that was our first published book, written, authored by a student. And again, it's a cute story about how to uh, use shadows and similar triangles to find the height of something. So you read the book to the students. In the back, it's got some suggested class discussions and suggestions for um, class activities. And I put an age range on there. The story is more for younger students, but I'd say a fifth grader would get into it. Even a high schooler could say, this was written by another high schooler. That opened the door to, okay, let's talk about this and share that with other students. Just last Saturday, we celebrated eight student authored and student illustrated books at the AV Cultural Fair. The students were able to be, the student authors and illustrators got to be up on stage. They were interviewed by local TV stations and paper and so forth. Uh, my promise to the students and to everybody else is impasse education will not take any profit from the students. 100% of the profits is shared between the student author and the student wow. illustrator. And I just love to see I've had that privilege of handing the student 
their first copy. And it goes back to that fish tank and the fish tank being yeah. real. But when they hold that, they're like, this is, this is yeah. real. This, this is, and they, they see their picture on the back as, and it's a good looking <laughs> book. So here's one. It's called the, the monsters of math. Oh. And the fishing derby. Oh. And so it's just a real book. And I mean, you look at the illustrations and so forth. This does not look like a student published I love this. that the characters in the book are doing a project. <laughs> like, yes, oh isn't God. that fantastic? Yeah. Wow. So in the next mm -hmm. week, what we're going to do is on our Impasse Education mm -hmm. website, we're going to add a page that lists all the student authored and student um, illustrated books and links to where those are. We just hadn't, we've been so busy, we haven't had time to do that. Um, on the back of every book, it encourages anyone who wants to be part of this to reach out to us because we're willing to work with anyone. Um, we want to break down the barriers of students seeing their own success. All of the authors, let, let's be honest, they may not come, go grow up and become professional authors as full-time jobs. But they can say at this moment and this moment in time, I authored a book and it's available for life on Amazon. And I also talked to students. I said, you make money from this for the rest of your life. Part of the book for a month and a half, but now you make money off of it for the rest of your life. And many of the students, I have um, two students in particular that come from the alternative education site. And they just, when I sat down with them because they told their teacher that, yeah, they would like to write a book. I said, okay. So I brought my computer, met with them. And I said, tell me about your book. Tell me what you want to write. They would not touch my computer. They wouldn't put their hands on my computer. And I was like, okay, I turned my computer back around. I said, talk to me. And I said, I'll type for you. Both gentlemen in two very different ways outlined six or seven books. And I was like, you are so creative. You are so, and they're divergent from each other and so forth. And I said, okay, I said, let's stop. I said, now let's pick one topic and develop that topic. And to listen to them create their story and they could verbally create their story. They still refuse to touch my computer. And so I, I wrote their, wrote up what they had, smoothed it out, sent it back to them via email, had them read it. And then they edited it. It's funny. The teacher printed it and they like old school edited it, and it back to me. And the process just went on. And Saturday at the event, um, they had, both of them had half their church there to support them and their extended family was there. And it was just that moment of students who are so removed from the potential of success now standing front and center and saying, I'm a published author, their pride, the way they look, the way they stand all changes. And it's that moment of, for me, because I have several career goals, but one big career goal was to really recapture the lost talent in the United States. And I, what I mean by that lost talent is the, the students that are get pushed to the side, they get marginalized, that their skills don't get recognized in school. And I look at Jimmy and Jay Sean, who authored these books. They are lost talent. They are so incredibly gifted. And for me to capture that at this moment, and now that I'll be able to like stay in touch with them, and propel them into different avenues that they may not have been open to in the past. That's that moment of, yeah, that's what we need to be doing. And I, I we did that at this point. Now, I didn't get all the lost talent, I know that. But this was that moment of realizing we've got some and let's keep going after more. And I think if we can break down those barriers and more students, more teachers, more administrators realize Oh, I do have a lot of talent pushed to the edges, pushed to the periphery of education. If I turn a spotlight on them, a true spotlight, looking for their true gifts and their true skills, what could we recapture? Because when you think about it, today's problems exist from today's thinking. Who doesn't have today's thinking? All the students who are pushed to the boundaries. So our solutions lie within that group of students, yet we're not doing anything to harness that or to foster or to promote it. As educators, as administrators, I beg you, 
turn your spotlight there. What can be accomplished? What are, what are those students capable of that we're totally minimizing or overlooking? So that's my challenge to administrators. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Um, yeah. We're coming up on our time here. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to say to our audience, to our principals, our campus leaders across the country? What I would want yeah. to say is they have an enormous amount of talent within any school district across the mm-hmm. country. You need to leverage that talent, not frustrate them, not overwhelm them. Find each of their individual talents and maximize mm-hmm. them. Stop thinking that every single person can be everything to everybody and harness what's there. If you're wanting to go project-based curriculum, do not, I can't say this enough, do not expect your teachers to be the ones to create the curriculum. It's too overwhelming. They have too many other things to do. And also they're not trained to do so. Hire a group that can do that or that can do it in conjunction with your teachers. Your teachers need to be a vital role in any curriculum you create, in any process you create. Your students, teachers, and families should be part of that. Change doesn't happen overnight. And be willing to put in the work and the long-term time and commitment to making it work. Five years before you see change. So that's my ending. My, my final thoughts is hold out for the correct change, not the flashy next moment thing. Where can our listeners go to find these books, to find more info about Math Literacy Project, about other work that you're doing? Yeah, just visit my webpage at impasseducation.com. Uh, and follow the tabs to get on any one of those topics. And like I said, we'll be adding the student-authored, student-illustrated books um, in the coming weeks. And to be clear, Impass is M-P-A-S-S. That is yeah. correct. And um, I would invite everyone to register. We have an upcoming conference at UCLA, uh, June 11th. And our conference focuses on fostering math literacy. And so you can sign up for the uh, conference through our website as well. Teresa, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Thanks for having me on. Bye. Bye. What a doozy. Man, I was getting teary. You will find that that is something that comes quite naturally to me. Um, But hearing her vision and her success what she's accomplished and her heart for bringing this to other classrooms, to other teachers. It's a tall order. It's going to take a commitment and investment. And I know that's hard. That can be a big ask, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. Um, As always, you can find links to all of the resources that she mentioned, um, all of the websites. I'll make sure to link, um, the Amazon shop so you can find all of the books that her students have published. Um, As always, um, our editing and our production for this podcast is done by Erwin Solbach and our logo and design work is from Alana Kanoi. Um, And this whole thing is just a labor of the deepest love for our campus leaders and our principals, our district admin from Responsive Learning. Um, Thank you guys so much for what you do. I hope you have a great rest of your day.